All right, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Vidya Ganapathy. I'm a project scientist here at LBL in the Molecular Biophysics and Integrated Bioimaging Group. And today I'd like to talk about some of my work using data to push limits in computational imaging. All right, so I wanna start my presentation with a little analogy. Um, say we have a bunch of cat photos. Uh, we have a lot of these photos, but unfortunately in every photo we're missing some pixels. Uh, so my question is, how do we fill in these missing pixels? So anyone who studies deep learning or machine learning will tell you that the answer is actually pretty simple. Um, what we can do is we can get a training set of data. And in your training set, for every photo with missing pixels, you have an equivalent photo that has all the pixels filled in. And what you can do is train a deep neural network. And so the deep neural network takes as input that photo with missing pixels, and you train the network such that the output matches the ground truth picture with the filled in pixels. So you train it with your entire training data set, and then you take your photos that have missing pixels that don't have a corresponding ground truth, and then you can put those photos into your neural network and fill in the pixels. Um, so that is the standard deep learning approach. However, that is actually not what I'm going to do, um, because in many applications of scientific discovery, you do not have a training data set uh, with a ground truth. All you have are these photos with missing pixels. Um, and so the underlying idea behind um, a lot of my recent work is that you want to train only with these pictures. You want to train with um, kind of a training data set that doesn't have a ground truth. And intuitively, just from looking at this picture, we can see kind of why that works. Um, if you look at all the cat photos, the missing pixels are from a different portion of the image every time. Um, so in some of the um, photos, we can see the cat's face, in some we can see the tail. And from all that information, you can intuitively see that you can build a general understanding of what a cat looks like. So then we can, from that general understanding, we can then take a single image and try to fill in those pixels. Um, and so that was an analogy for the scientific applications that I work on. And we use that underlying idea um, to solve problems in computed tomography, LED array microscopy, and my current focus here at LBL, serial femtosecond crystallography. And I will get into the, all those applications a little bit more soon. Um, so I wanna take a step back and first talk about trade-offs in imaging. Um, so in any imaging system, you have various trade-offs. Uh, for example, a very conventional one is in a conventional light field microscope, you have different microscope objectives. Um, generally, you can either, uh, you can trade off resolution and field of view. You can either have a low field of view, so a very small uh, area image and a high resolution, or you can switch your objective um, and get a very low resolution and a larger area image. And traditionally, those trade-offs have, have been done by changing the hardware. Um, and in that simple example, you can change the microscope objective. However, um, what's done in more modern imaging systems, uh, in computational imaging, is we combine hardware with software post-processing. Um, and these trade-offs can be done with a mixture of changes in hardware and changes in software. So for example, in LED array microscopy, you can get both high resolution and high field of view with a computational post-processing algorithm. However, you get low speed. And finally, uh, what's been done more recently is this combination of computational imaging and machine learning. So when we look at our trade-offs polygon, now we've added another vertex and that vertex relates to the amount of training data that you have. So to make this a little more concrete, we can look at Fourier tachygraphic microscopy. This is also known as LED array microscopy. And what you do is you take a regular microscope, a light microscope used for imaging biological samples. You take the light source and you replace it with a two-dimensional array of light emitting diodes. 
then you can turn on these LEDs sequentially and you can take an image for each LED illumination. So if you have 100 LEDs in your array, then you would have 100 images. And from the stack of images, you can post-process them, getting a final object reconstruction that's high in resolution and high in field of view. Um, and also you get the added benefit of imaging quantitative phase and amplitude. So this little animation shows how that works. You sweep through the LEDs in the array, and for each LED, you modulate different spatial frequencies into the passband of the microscope. Uh, so the passband of the microscope is defined by the numerical aperture of the objective. Um, with Fourier tachygraphic microscopy, you can image spatial frequencies that go beyond uh, what is defined by the numerical aperture of the microscope. Okay, so Fourier tachygraphic microscopy is great because you can get high resolution and high field of view. However, as I just explained, you have to take many images and then computationally post-process them, um, which leads you to very low speed. What we would like is we would like to get high resolution, high field of view, and high speed. Um, so what we can do is we can first think about supervised deep learning. And with this LED array, you can illuminate multiple LEDs at once and create multiplex patterns. Uh, so what we can do is we can uh, randomly pick patterns. We can take a single image, so a single low resolution image, and we can um, relate it to its ground truth. So the ground truth would be the high resolution amplitude and phase object. And like I explained with the cat photos earlier, we can train a neural, neural network transform to go from low resolution image to high resolution phase and amplitude object. And this would create a method that was very fast because you're training only a single image to go to the high resolution object as opposed to the stack of LED array images. However, the problem with this is that to collect the ground truth, you need to, for every low resolution image, also collect the full stack of images um, to compute what the ground truth output would be. And this is not possible if your specimen is moving or if it's changing, if you want to do live imaging. Um, so you're really limited in terms of scientific discovery what you can do here. So what we turn to is, oh, and so, yeah, and so to make that um, even more concrete, um, this is a chicken and egg problem. If you have a fast imaging method, you can get the ground truth. Uh, and if you have the ground truth, you can get the fast imaging method. So we really can't get around this in the case of live imaging. So what we turn to is we turn to self-supervised deep learning. And in particular, my group has developed what we call the physics informed variational autoencoder. Um, and to get take a very high level bird's eye view of the mathematics of this, um, we have our low resolution measurements, so a single image um, for every uh, field of view. And what we do is we uh, train our system. So our system is everything in these blue boxes and kind of this middle part here. So we train this whole system such that we put in our input, our low resolution image, and we want our output to be that same low resolution image. And an intermediate output of um, this framework is the high resolution phase and amplitude object. And we can regularize the system with incorporating the known imaging physics. Um, so by incorporating that known imaging physics, we can go from high resolution object that we predict back down to predicted low resolution measurement. And if that measurement output is the same as the input, then we are doing well. Okay, so we uh, prototype that for synthetic data. Um, and uh, what we found is that our physics informed variational autoencoder, which is what we're calling our self supervised method, uh, outperforms standard iterative methods. And what's notable is it not only outperforms standard iterative methods where we just used a single low resolution image, it also outperformed methods where we used a stack of 29 low resolution images. So this column here is 29 low resolution images and the physics informed variational autoencoder only uses a single low resolution image per field of view, but still does better. 
Um, and so then I had two students, Yolanda and Andrew, do some experimental validation for this idea. And they first took a baseline measurement, so a single LED illumination um, per image, uh, and they took 85 images for a single field of view. And then they took uh, another set of data where they had uh, different random patterns for every single field of view. Uh, so they had uh, about 85 different total fields of view and trained the physics informed variation autoencoder. And what's interesting is that with the physics informed variation autoencoder, they were able to get phase contrast that was not available with a standard iterative method. Um, and then I also had three other students, Judith, Min, and Ray, who um, prototyped the physics informed variation autoencoder for computed tomography. And this is uh, with synthetic data. Um, and they were here at the summer uh, using nurse resources. Um, and uh, they were able to show improvements over uh, conventional computed tomography reconstruction for sparse sinograms. And finally, uh, my current work is focusing on serial femtosecond crystallography. And the idea is to use the physics informed variational autoencoder. But in this case, we actually don't have perfect knowledge of the forward physics. So we want to also incorporate model correction. And this is work being done in the Souter group here, um, along with Aaron Brewster and Daniel Chone. And all this work um, would not be possible without NERSC. And I just want to highlight a few reasons why NERSC can help with this work. Um, the main thing is the availability of resources, the ability to distribute neural network training over an arbitrary number of GPUs, um, and also to be able to submit jobs simultaneously with different hyperparameters. And most importantly, I think, is the great education. So the new user training, as well as the support desk for helping train um, uh, six under, summer undergraduate students. Uh, so currently in progress, I just had three students uh, finish an internship this past summer, and we are finishing up some larger scale tests with computed tomography on Perlmutter. And then um, also in progress is that work on serial femtosecond crystallography. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge all the funding sources of this work and um, all the resources related to all these projects that I've talked about, all the code and data is available online. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. So I thought with autoencoders, they generally um, perform dimensionality reduction. So how do you get a higher resolution in the middle? Okay, so first of all, this is a variational autoencoder. And really what we're doing is we're using the mathematics of it to um, develop this system. We're actually not doing dimensionality reduction. So we put in our image, our input and our latent space is actually larger. Um, and uh, then we process that into the object. So we're really just using the mathematical framework. We're not really, this is not really an autoencoder. Oh. Yeah. But it is an autoencoder, I guess, in the sense that your input and output are the same. So um, what cases do you recommend to use a physics inferred variation autoencoder? other than other um, kind of modules, such as normal variational autoencoder. Okay, oh, okay, so you're saying uh, where, when do we want to use a variational autoencoder as opposed to a regular autoencoder? Yeah, okay, so the reason we're using um, a kind of a variational framework here is because we don't know what the prior is. Um, so we're actually developing um, a prior distribution for the data. So if you remember that um, image of the cats with the missing pixels, we don't know what the prior is because we don't have any ground truth. So we're trying to see what prior distribution best describes that kind of like partial data that I have. And that's why we want to use the variational framework. So really any situation in which you're trying to do scientific discovery, where you have all these measurements and you're saying what caused those measurements. Yeah, very good question. Thanks. Awesome. All right. No, no, no. Thank you so much.